Russia has plunged Europe into crisis as President Vladimir Putin threatens to invade neighboring Ukraine and expand his sphere of influence in the region. But there are questions not only about Russia's intention in Europe, but what it wants to do in Africa. It's not the only world power with its eyes on the continent. Africa's close ties with China has Western nations worried about what exactly Beijing is up to. Are the West's warnings about Russia and China in Africa warranted or overblown? This week, we'll bring you in-depth reporting and analysis on the subject, and we'll hear what Africans think about China and Russia's dealings in their countries. Straight Talk Africa starts now. Hello and welcome to Straight Talk Africa. I'm Heidi Adams. Russia's renewed interest in Africa. What's behind it? The former Soviet power is quietly strengthening its ties with Africa, signing political, military and economic deals with several countries on the continent. And that's raised eyebrows and deep concerns among Western nations about Russia's tactics and goals in Africa. VOA's Carol Gunsberg has more. Russian flags waved in Burkina Faso's capital following January's military coup in the West African nation. A statue unveiled in the Central African Republic last fall shows local soldiers backed by Russian fighters protecting civilians. Those are the more obvious symbols of Russia's resurgent presence on the continent. Africa is a foreign policy priority, Russian President Vladimir Putin said at the first Russia-Africa summit of political and business leaders in 2019. It was agreed at the summit to create a new mechanism for dialogue in the form of a Russia-Africa partnership. A second summit is planned for St. Petersburg in October. The first, at the Black Sea resort town of Sochi, generated diplomatic agreements and billions of dollars worth of deals for arms, agriculture, energy and more, said organizer Ross Congress Foundation. Moscow has been building new ties and refreshing alliances forged during the Cold War, when the former Soviet Union supported socialist movements across Africa. After the Soviet Union's collapse in 1991, it largely withdrew from the continent. Russia's overtures in recent years offer cooperation without the political or other conditions imposed by Western countries, Putin has said. Russia provides um, as did the Soviet Union before an alternative vision for African nations. Um, and uh, if there is one common feature between what the Russians are doing now and what the Soviets used to do, uh, it's this common anti-Western critique. The spread of militant Islamist extremism and other violence in Africa has created more openings for Russia's military. In Mali, so has the planned drawdown of troops by France Mali's former colonial ruler and partner in the fight against jihadists for nearly a decade. Private military contractors also are helping advance Moscow's agendas in Africa, Western observers say. These include fighters in the shadowy Wagner Group, allegedly controlled by Putin associate Yevgeny Prigozhin. Putin has denied any connection with the group. It is not the state. It is private business with private interests tied to extracting energy resources including various resources like gold or precious stones. Not so, says Joseph Siegel, who directs research for the Africa Center for Strategic Studies, part of the U.S. Defense Department. Every place we've seen uh, Wagner deployed around the world and in Africa, be it in Libya, Sudan, Mozambique, Central African Republic, it has been a destabilizing force. Siegel says mercenaries are part of Moscow's toolkit to prop up weak African leaders in exchange for economic or other advantages. They aid elites, not average citizens. What Russia has been doing um, has been uh, deploying mercenaries, um, disinformation, election interference, arms for resources, deals, opaque contracts aimed at uh, capturing uh, wider influence. The United Nations is investigating reports of grave human rights abuses in the Central African Republic, allegedly committed by private military personnel. 
Meanwhile, Russian mercenaries are glorified as public protectors amid a coup attempt in the 2021 Russian film The Tourist. The movie, set in the Central African Republic, reportedly was funded by Putin ally Prigozhin. In Mali, the leaders of a 2020 military coup have brought in Russian military trainers and what U.S. and French authorities say are Wagner mercenaries. Some in Mali welcomed them by waving Russian flags, reflecting not only the country's historic ties with the former USSR, but also public impatience over continued insecurity, says Niagale Bagayoko, a Paris-based political scientist who chairs the African Security Network. The NGO seeks security and justice reforms. In 2013, the Malian population were enthusiastic when the French arrived in the countries. And you can see today that they are rejecting their presence. To be honest, I would not be very surprised if in two years or so, uh, the same could happen uh, with the Russian presence, in fact. Bagayoko says African countries are showing a willingness to look beyond a single foreign partner. Uh, there is the realization of the fact that being only engaged with a single actors uh, or uh, with a, a single group of countries uh, is uh, restricting the, 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 the possibilities uh, for uh, diplomacy, uh, but also for um, military uh, apparatus. Russia isn't the only foreign government trying to broaden influence in Africa home to vast resources, including a surging youth population. The White House plans a second U.S.-Africa summit later this year, and the European Union has announced a new $172 million investment in the infrastructure countering China's Belt and Road Initiative. China is Africa's biggest economic partner. Carol Gunsberg, VOA News. So there you have the background to Russia's history in Africa and what its presence on the continent looks like today. And VOA's Salem Solomon has been covering this story for several years and she joins me here in studio. Salem, thank you so much for being here. Really great to see you. Thank you for uh, having me on the show. Welcome to Straight Talk Africa. Uh, Salem, this has been your beat for several years. The, this is, of course, not Russia's first rodeo in Africa. The Soviet powers' assistance for liberation movements um, during the anti-colonial uh, struggle, of course. And then during the Cold War era, Russia was very active on the continent in proxy wars. But I want to talk about Russia in Africa today. Uh, you started reporting a few years ago um, about Russian mercenaries and their activities on the continent. Uh, now we're seeing more reporting, especially in recent coups, about this connection between um, the coups in Mali, in Burkina Faso, in um, Sudan, and this shadowy uh, mercenary group called Wagner, and of course President Vladimir Putin. Tell us a little bit about these connections. Thank you. Yes, uh, the Wagner group, the mysterious Wagner group that everybody wants to know about. Um, so just as, as you said, it's a group that started in 2014 when paramilitaries got together to militarily assist in, in the invasion of Crimea. It's so relevant right now when we're talking about, I mean, they saw, the government, Russian government saw some sort of effectiveness in the way that paramilitaries are used in these uh, operations. Fast forward uh, into today's world, you know, Wagner was exposed uh, because of the investigation of journalists and exiled Russian uh, you know, uh, researchers outside, but it's a mysterious uh, group of paramilitaries that is not registered anywhere. In fact, some experts argue that it doesn't exist as an entity. Uh, but what it is is, is uh, a group that allows a lot of paramilitaries to come and basically fight other countries, uh, uh, you know, uh, wars sometimes, but also an extension for the Russian government's, you know, foreign policy. So. Say, for instance, uh, they military intervene in countries and then see, assess the ground, and then, uh, you know, they use Russian passports, they use uh, some sort of support, transportation, and others uh, to uh, facilitate whatever it is uh, Kremlin's or the government, Russian government's agenda is uh, abroad. And we've seen them uh, sprung up in the Central African Republic, in South Africa, in, uh, you know, volatile places where 
you know, uh, there's conflict. And so, um, you know, it is an extension of the, the policy that Russia follows. Uh, and talking about Russia's agenda, what is the end game for them here in, in Africa? Uh, th there's this renewed interest on the part of the Russians. What is really behind that? Is this just about antagonizing the West? Is it about, you know, increasing its sphere of influence across the globe? Um, and or is it ultimately about access to power and, by extension, access to the continent's mineral, mineral resources? That's actually a very good question because it's very complicated. Russia's Russia, despite its presence, or perceived or real presence, is actually a really uh, small country. And, and, you know, its economy is even uh, less than Italy's. And so it doesn't have the economic power, and it's under a lot of sanctions because of, you know, uh, so many uh, uh, reasons. And so it's complicated because Russia mm. follows what uh, a model called hybrid model. Uh, what that means is that uh, say, for instance, if military, uh, you know, exercises uh, or paramilitary mercenaries uh, go in into a country, they start advising uh, the Central African Republic is a very good example. This, they start advising the presidency to do other, uh, you know, uh, political or diplomatic uh, opportunities, or they forge relationships so that they could have, you know, mineral extraction uh, kind of relationships. So it really, really varies on what part of the, the world, basically, they operate. But in Africa, we've seen them in Libya, for instance. We've seen uh, Russian foreign policy play out uh, with, with the help of some of the, these mercenaries. Uh, you know, if it means that, uh, say, for instance, they're arming two sides in Libyan conflict, uh, militants uh, that are supporting a UN-supported uh, uh, government or, or, or militias, they will do both so that the, you know, they can uh, influence the perception that whenever the West interferes in these countries, that there is chaos. And so uh, there's different approaches that they go about it. So this uh, hybrid model that we're talking about has different facets. Uh, it could be military, it could be econom economically. Uh, if they see that there's a mineral rich country that they want to, you know, expand, they do that as well. Uh, in the Central African Republic, uh, it's uh, kind of complicated, uh, and, and, and you see a lot of military mercenary action in, in, in Mozambique and the Central Afri African Republic as well. And, and so it really depends on um, how they approach it. And sometimes, uh, you know, they, they spend so little and get uh, uh, so much for, for what they do. For instance, uh, Evgeny Prigozhin is a very famous name, and the reason why he even came to this picture is because he was in charge of information warfare, basically, what is commonly known as uh, trolls, you know, troll farms. And so they spread information uh, and interfere in elections, uh, interfere in uh, basically dominating public perception about the West if it's, you know, uh, if it's uh, negative uh, and, and influencing, you know, spreading false news, they're very involved. And Prigozhin was sanctioned uh, because of his involvement, because of these, uh, the far troll farms that he funded uh, in the U.S. election, which is a very prominent and one known. But they've used the same tactics in supporting autocratic regimes like, you know, Sudan, uh, Omar al-Bashir, uh, in, in other parts of the world as well. Mali, you know, exploiting uh, perceptions of, say, for instance, if there's a uh, negative perception about the French, they exploit either local uh, grievances that communities have or uh, foreign, um, you know, uh, skepticism. You're talking here about public perception, um, especially in, in places that were former Francophone um, countries. We went to the streets of Ouagadougou in uh, Burkina Faso, and we asked Burkina Nabe what they think about Russia's presence and plans in their country. Just take a listen to how much people know and what they say about it. We have friends present here and Russia is here. We do not refuse, but if they come to help us in a partnership context, that's good. A win-win partnership. If France is here too, it is to help us. And if Russia comes to help us too, well then, uh, we're talking about partnership. 
France has been there for years, but things are not moving. If Wagner also wants to come and sign a win-win partnership contract with us, that's not a problem. We rather want people to come to train us so that we ourselves, as Burkina Bay, can lead the fight ourselves. Yes, I think that's a good thing because we feel like many of our people are dying. Our brothers and sisters are being killed, so we need help. We need them to come help us to avoid many deaths and help us achieve peace. I think it all depends on the agreements we sign with them. If you sign fair agreements, that's good. We must always sign fair deals. We must not sign as if we are part of a colony. We are independent. If we have to sign agreements, they have to suit us. Well, if the Russians come to Burkina, we'll be really happy because we only want peace. Whoever comes, who can help us overcome our problems and anxieties. But if it's true what they say about them, then even if they come to Burkina, it will be the same. Especially for us women. Rape? We don't like rape. Sincerely, we don't. Salam, as you can see there, people saying no harm in Russia's presence here unless they're they're here to as long as they're here to help um, as long as they're here to bring and keep the peace and of course people even mentioning the Wagner group does that line up in terms of public perception with what the kind of reporting that you're seeing around how people feel about Russia in their countries some research groups have studied this and surveyed you know people people's perception um, and it's, it's a mixed bag because, you know, there are some people who are skeptical and there are some people who are going to be, uh, you know, optimistic about the opportunity for any superpower to come and, you know, provide them multi-faceted uh, opportunities, especially in places where there's abject poverty. Of course, you know, the, the reception uh, will be positive. But instances of, you know, what the mercenary groups have, have done on the continent has been received negatively. And I can mention examples in Libya earlier, as I said, you know, mercenary groups are responsible for what, um, you know, human rights groups call war crimes. And in some instances, they were booby trapping civilian, you know, uh, residences uh, and, and, you know, leaving calling cards where people, children in, in some instances were affected by. Uh, in the Central African Republic, they were accused of, you know, torture. And this is a similar tactic that they've used in Syria and other parts of the world that, that these, uh, you know, mercenaries have been active. And, um, and there's no accountability. And so, and part of the reason why, uh, it, you know, this myth about the Wagner group not even ex is existing as an entity is because uh, it's very hard to trace if it weren't for you know, journalists exposing them. And in fact, they've paid a really hard, you know, price uh, because of it. In 2018, three journalists, Russian red journalists, who went to the Central African Republic were killed uh, in the process of ambushed uh, while they were in the process of documenting the works of uh, Evgeny Prigozhin's, uh, you know, funded uh, uh, projects, uh, including troll, troll farms, uh, mercenaries, uh, and so, you know, people have paid the price for exposing this. And so we are in a better place now to understand uh, the operation of, of uh, groups like Wagner Group because of uh, researchers and, and reporters who've exposed uh, the works of Russia. And so these kinds of, uh, you know, multifaceted uh, or hybrid model is also reflected in places like Sudan. Uh, during the autocratic regime of uh, Omar al-Bashir, Omar al-Bashir had a deal with, uh, you know, different groups that come, come in, but also advised him to uh, crack down on, you know, grassroots democratic movement like in Sudan. So I spoke to a while back uh, to uh, Suleiman Bado when, you know, the U.S. Uh, Treasury put sanctions on uh, these, you know, uh, efforts that were funded by Evgeny Prigozhin. And uh, they were spreading false information uh, to skew uh, the perception of the people on social media 
uh, and, and other accounts so, so, so they can basically have al-Bashir or you know, extend his stay in power uh, and, and help him that way. And also they were advising him to commit you know, uh, executions in public so that uh, you know, people would be afraid and not to go out and protest. I want to play um, that clip quickly of your conversation with uh, Suleiman Baldo. In the documents that were leaked by Russian dissidents in the UK of internal uh, Prigozhin network documentation, there was a whole set uh, of uh, in, in notes advising Umar al-Bashir to set uh, a fake news uh, platform as you said, to discredit the leaders of the protest as anti-Islam, as have been, uh, you know, influenced by Israel, and as have been, you know, basically uh, advocating for things that in a traditional society like Sudan would be seen as unacceptable and so on and so forth. In these documents, it was a sloppy job because this is clearly a, co a copy and paste of the same tactics that the Putin regime used against the democratic opposition to his own regime within Russia itself. Because in many instances, you know, they, instead of saying the Sudanese of the opposition, the documents would say Russian uh, opposition, for example. So that indicates a direct link to the uh, technology and strategies uh, of fake news platforms that were used uh, in, in, in Russia against the democratic opposition and also exported by the troll farms across the world and particularly to the U.S. as has been proven by U.S. Uh, competent agencies and courts uh, in this country. And that was Suleiman Baldo from the Century Group, which investigates and researches um, money connected to war criminals. Um, Salim, this is all very very fascinating and very interesting. Uh, you know, the United States seems to be very concerned about um, China's activities on the continent. Um, but we hear, of course, Russia, which is no great friend of the United States, really, uh, Russia's activities. Is the United States more concerned about China in Africa than it is about Russia in Africa? You know, from what we hear from government officials, U.S. officials, is that the United States wants to be a, a, a partner of choice. And so, uh, you know, we hear a lot of administration officials saying, uh, you know, because of uh, the relationships that China has or Russia has, uh, which really varies depending on eco economic relationship that are, you know, dubious uh, contracts and, and lack of accountability, the U.S. wants to build a relationship that is based on principles. And so, you know, sometimes that doesn't go a long way. And, uh, and that's what we've seen. And, and, and we've seen, I think, in recent administrations, we've seen a change of that. Because when you see Americans, usually you're right. You know, uh, Americans uh, are either giving aid uh, or uh, Americans are uh, building military to military partnership in most parts of Africa. Uh, and uh, surveys show that Africans want to see uh, more than just, you know, people, they want to see people in briefcases uh, instead of, you know, coming in with, you know, as a, you know, as a soldier or, or just, you know, uh, that kind of dependent relationship that you have when there's aid involved. And uh, recent administrations have changed initiatives like, you know, Power Africa, or designed to empower Africans uh, using electricity and things like that. Um, you've seen companies also forging a relationship with, with African countries so that uh, you, know, you have that business to business partnership. Innovation is, is, is also uh, allowed. And also AGOA, you know, the uh, duty-free duty uh, relationship that, that, that America is, is, is enabled so far. But, but, but are those things enough, though? Um, is America doing enough to counter China, for instance? Um, China is the world's largest creditor. Um, how does America change strategy? Do the Americans understand that? And what are they prepared to do beyond what they've done in the past? What are they prepared to do to, to change and, and be a, the kind of partner that Africa needs and wants? Yes, and so uh, is that enough? That's a very, very valid question. Uh, you're looking at uh, a competition that's, you know, has said, you know, when you look at China, China between the year 2000 and 2019 only, only they've invested so much, 100. 
50 plus billion dollars. Uh, and so the competition in terms of the money uh, involved in this is, you know, astronomical. And when, when China builds relationship with, China, with African countries, uh, it's also multifaceted. It's not just, you know, infrastructural development. Um, you know, at, at what cost that comes can be debated, uh, obviously. But uh, I think, as I said, uh, the U.S. is trying to uh, build a relationship that is uh, of mutual principles uh, and, uh, and based on, you know, becoming uh, a partner of choice, basically, fundamentally. Uh, not because, you know, especially because Africans have been through colonialism and, and, and civil war. And that's, you know, that's the skepticism. I, that's what I want to get to because, um, you know, for some, this might start looking like Cold War era deja vu again. Um, countries outside of the continent um, tensions and rivalries between them and Africa smack bang in the middle at risk of being the sort of proxy battleground again. Um, you spoke to analyst um, and author Lina Ben Abdallah. Um, tell us a little bit about what she said because I want to play um, an excerpt of, of that interview. That's right. And so uh, Lina r really expands on this idea about, you know, undercutting relationships for Africans agency, for instance. Uh, when, you, when Africans are given a choice because, you know, or forced to make a choice because, you know, uh, China would make a relationship or build a relationship maybe because, you know, uh, they want to take sides. Uh, and, and, you know, some policies like one China policy or uh, don't speak about, you know, the, the human rights abuses that China has, all the, those kinds of principles that really go against with the U.S. That, and be forced to make choices. Uh, it really, uh, you know, takes away the agency from Africans making a choice uh, right. and, and takes away the uh, uh, benefit for average Africans in some cases uh, that live in abject poverty. Well, Africa's agency um, is what Lina Ben Abdullah talks about. Let's take a look at what she says. What we have seen in the past, um, you know, Africa being sort of this uh, playground or theater of, um, you know, uh, essentially bipolar world. Um, and you have, you know, one power on this one side and the other power on the other side and sort of Africa sort of being in the middle as sort of this power grab. Um, a, a, a place. The problem there is, you know, that there is very difficult and challenging situation to exercise any agency if um, African leaders don't know who they are dealing with or who, what are the potentials for these investments that are going on with either China or other powers. And so moving forward, uh, you know, when we see the tensions between the U.S. and China uh, unravel themselves in Africa, then the worry is that, you know, by not necessarily uh, understanding the potential and, and knowing what's going on uh, in these uh, relationships, it's, it's, it, it would be easy to think about um, another, you know, Cold War scenario playing out again. And I think that that would be the hardest thing to see is that if, uh, you know, uh, in, if instead of um, negotiating strong uh, deals, with China or with any other partners, then um, if you see, you know, uh, power relations play out and then, you know, countries take inside. Lina Ben Abdullah there. And that's what we'll discuss further after the break when we're joined by analyst Pipo Kushle Nyandu. We're going to talk about Africa, Africa's agency, and we're going to take a closer look at the new scramble for Africa as world powers to the north, west, and east vie for primacy on the continent. Uh, what does Africa stand to gain? Our panelists will give you their take when we come back. Health, wellness, Sport, beauty, medical breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well-being. What are the main health concerns in Africa and around the world? Find out the latest on coronavirus. Connect with our experts and ask them questions. How long does the virus stay? Join me, Lino Khmudu, in Washington every week on Healthy Living. Right here on VOA.
Welcome back to Straight. We're discussing Russia and China's intentions and influence on the African continent and why Western countries are so worried about it. So do African countries necessarily share those concerns? And if we are looking at a so-called new scramble for Africa or Russia and China's push for a new world order, what is in it for Africa? I'm joined now by my guest, Piwo Kushle Mnyandu. He's a professor of African studies at Howard University here in Washington, D.C. He specializes in economic and political relations between South Africa and China. And, of course, back with us is Salem Solomon. She is the lead editor in VOA's News Center. Piwo Kushle, welcome. Thank you for being here. It's good to be here with you and Salem uh, uh, Heidi. And I'm going to put this first question to you. Uh, is there really a, a new scramble for Africa? And, and are we looking at a new push by Russia and China for so-called new world order? Yeah, it, it depends on what we, we mean by scramble. So if scramble means, for example, the exportation of mineral resources with little accountability, if uh, scramble for Africa means that uh, certain foreign players from China and other countries come in and are able to get uh, significant concessions to be able to have their hands on very significant amount of uh, natural resources in a country with um, very little state capacity to gain as much uh, leverage and as much tax incentives for the country in order to develop, then it does constitute a scramble. So it's a kind of a new scramble, as you say, and I would agree that there is a new scramble. Uh, Salem, I would like to come to you um, as well. What's your take? Do you think there is a scramble for Africa? Are we looking at a new world order? Well, the way I look at it is, you know, any superpower or any African country would like to forge partnership. Uh, we are living in a global world and everybody's going to look out for their own interest. So we don't have to be naive about that. Uh, what I think, um, I, mean, I feel like scramble for Africa is kind of outdated to think about uh, the today's context because we're talking in numbers when we're talking about African countries. We have 50 plus countries. What is China interested in, in getting, gaining from uh, 50 plus countries that might not have economic advantages, uh, although they are resource rich? So for, for instance, uh, the concessions that uh, you know, uh, we were talking about earlier, concessions, what does it look like? Because China is, is really dumping huge amount of money. We talked about 150 billion B with a B. And so uh, what that means is that, uh, you know, they might look for, and, and there's this whole debate about debt trap diplomacy, they might look for concessions in, in, in different ways. And so be it uh, votes in the UN, uh, you know, you have 50 plus countries, so you can make an impact that way. Uh, it really depends on, on what kind of concession. Do you have a strategic asset that they want to, uh, you know, take advantage of? And now we are seeing, despite a 1940s uh, law that really pushes back on Chinese outside interference, we're seeing bases being built. Uh, and in fact, when China decided uh, to make that first move, they went to Djibouti. Nowhere else in the world but Djibouti because there's a strategic you know, uh, uh, area uh, where there's a lot of you know, foreign powers there, including the U.S., there's a, a U.S. base there. And so what you see in terms of how they think about their approach is very complex and long-term. Unlike mm -hmm. Russia, what they think about in terms of uh, gaining from Africans is, is, is long-term, building relationship long-term. Uh, and, and, you know, human rights groups and rights groups have called on China to say, you know, let's see what you're signing. Let's see what's on, on the table when African governments, who sometimes are not really accountable to their people, are signing deals. Uh, one example is the Kenya example, the standard uh, gauge railway, okay. is one great example to think about. And, you know, a lot of journalists have pressed the, pre the president of Kenya to really, uh, uh, you know, explain how much debt uh, that Kenyans uh, have and, you know, always dance around the issue and still, uh, you know, uh, you don't know what, what be, what's being signed and there's a lot of enabling corruption going on there. Another example is Zambia, for instance. You know, Zambia right now has an estimated five to six billion uh, debt uh, on China. The first country to default exactly. on the continent. But that also helped, you know, the now president, Hachilema, to really run on that uh, you know, to talk about corruption, not being transparent. And so, 
it, it, it is kind of complicated in a way, but China really sees benefits in the way that it invests uh, in long term, uh, you know, uh, you know, kind of benefit uh, from, from African countries. But almost always a sort of knock-on effect that does flow into the politics of the country. We're going to talk a little bit about that a little later on. But, uh, Piwa Kushle, I want to come to you again and talk to you about what the theme is of our show today, which is about the, the warnings from, from Western countries about Russia and especially China on the African continent. Um, on the whole, are those warnings and those worries, are they warranted or... Are they really overblown? I mean, how do the Africans see it? Well, it depends on, on which part. I think I agree with Salem. They, there are different regions of Africa. So it depends on the, the, the relative stability, as far as security is concerned, of each region. So they have a reason to be worried, for example, in a hitherto quite peaceful region of southern Africa. Well, unbeknownst to a few, uh, some of us, a, a couple of uh, years ago, some insurgents started showing up in north of Mozambique. And before you know it, a whole bunch of them showed up. Of course, it's instructive that it's around natural resources. Uh, it coincides with the discovery of offshore resources of natural gas. Well, guess what? The Wagner Group shows up and it leaves South African, Southern African governments um, were non-committal in sending troops. It was not until Rwanda, which is two borders away and clearly saw, felt threatened by this, knowing that the, the route that many of these uh, insurgents took was through Tanzania, which is one border away. It wasn't until Rwanda sent its troops, then the Southern Africans started acting on these warnings that had been loud and clear. So any time there is indecision amongst us Southern or African governments, outside powers have every right to actually be concerned because of spill uh, or because of effects that it's spillover effects. So the spillover effects warrant this attention. Uh, Salem, uh, I want to come back to the money. China is, of course, Africa's largest economic uh, partner. Um, and I want you to look here. According to analysis by the Center for Global Development, China has invested around $23 billion in infrastructure projects um, alone on the continent. And, of course, as you mentioned earlier, the most well-known being the Belt and Road Initiative. How has this initiative, though, played out in different countries on the continent? Um, my guess is it's not the same kind of investment um, countries have different needs. So how are those different in different African countries? Yes, it's always, it always varies in different countries. And also, uh, maybe the, the, the way that they approach, you know, the, the exam, uh, the, the, the bank that is connected to the Communist Party in China, and the way they do about their business might vary uh, based on the internal politics of the country. Uh, sometimes they have to work with you know, autocrats and that are not accountable to their people, uh, which is unfortunately most of the time the case in, in African countries. But there are some democratic uh, countries that really hold, uh, you know, they're powerful to account to some extent. And so they really go about it uh, and they're very flexible in the way that they're going about um, uh, deals that they make. But most of the time they are close to the government and leadership. Uh, and, they, and this is reflected in the way that they do all kinds of businesses with different African countries. Uh, with the pandemic, uh, China has scaled back a little bit because of the pandemic. Uh, and, you know, it has faced a lot of backlash uh, because of the pandemic. And there's been a lot of, you know, xenophobia in some parts of uh, Africa uh, because, you know, there's a lot of uh, Chinese um, um, business uh, men and women who migrated and live in, 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 in Africa, uh, uh, millions of them uh, across the continent. Um, to be fair, there's been also backlash uh, of Africans in China as well. And so that also uh, creates a dent in the relationship, uh, not just at, at the political level, but also on the person-to-person -person level, uh, when you see uh, how that, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, plays out. But China has really used this uh, pandemic to uh, kind of build relationship with governments as well, you know, giving P PPE to medical gear to, uh, to different countries, uh, what some call the mask diplomacy. And, and the vaccine <laughs> diplomacy. We and the vaccine well. diplomacy. Uh, has that played out well, especially in the past three years? We have yet to see because it's really created a dent in the perception uh, of, of, uh, of Chinese government and, Ch and Chinese in, in general. Uh, but overall, you know, uh, it, I feel I think from what we've seen, what we've read, uh, the China-Africa relationship is 
uh, long term, and that's the way the Chinese approach, uh, the way they approach anything, uh, be it you know building a relationship on a technological front uh, or people to people's relationship. Um, I would like to talk to, uh, like, to like to talk about the media aspect of things later on, but uh, that's how they approach it. So sometimes they've reaped the benefit of it, uh, and and maybe they have you know. Uh, been able to gain some votes or relationship with governments, um, but this pandemic has really put a dent. Uh, 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 you know, there's this adage that refers to romantic relationships that um, opposites attract, you know, and in your book, which is not a romantic novel, by the way, you lay mm -hmm. out the differences between uh, South Africa, for example, and China. Not just that it's, it has differences in terms of um, geographic and, and population sizes, but politics and societal norms. South Africa is, is a young, multi-party democracy. China largely seen as a one-state authoritarian surveillance state. Uh, what are the values that China and African countries Take, for example, South Africa really share. I mean, um, do they have anything in common whenever we see world leaders on stage having these bilateral um, meetings? They talk about the values they share and the worldviews that they have in common. Uh, what's going on in the case of South Africa and China? Uh, do they have much in common? Or is the relationship purely transactional? And is that sustainable? A lot of questions for you. Well, once you, once you talk about values, you are right there on dangerous ground because these values are going to differ from country to country, especially democratic values, especially accountability values. And, and many African countries do have challenges, and these challenges vary. In South Africa, for example, those they may not be as pronounced, but they are very significant. Um, there's a very significant deficit in values when it comes to uh, current leadership and um, uh, accountability around some of the most fundamental things like public spending and uh, fighting corruption and dealing with crime. Meanwhile, on the other side, you have a very authoritarian country, but that one that is quite efficient in statecraft and dealing with crime and being accountable in government. So there are things that the Africans, on, at least the South Africans, they may be tempted, they are often tempted to learn. They always go on trips to China, and it's usually political party to political party. This is a problem right there, because who knows if the African National Congress will be in charge of South Africa in 2024. So, and nonetheless, they go over there and they come back very enthusiastic about what they've learned, efficiency and, and how, to, uh, how to execute this, how to plan, and so on and so forth. However, they are quickly met by the realities of their country, in this case, South Africa, a multi-democratic country where every decision made by policymaking elites must, uh, it will come under judicial review. And it is right there, the Chinese model and the South African model, you know, they part ways because in the face of a multi-party democratic society, where people are hardly ever pleased about most things and they express it and they're allowed to express it, you have a problem. You have a problem with things that you learn from uh, kind of China. So the Africans then, there are still things that they wish they would learn and they perhaps should learn. However, the Africans must know also that what they want in their systems of, of government. And uh, right now, most African countries are not showing signs that they do know exactly what they like. People, uh, Kushle and Salem, please stay with us. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to continue this conversation. You're watching Straight Talk Africa. Stay with us.
um, the presence of China in my country has to, uh, it, it is two-sided. It is negative, on the other side positive. One of the negative effect is we, we, there is profit repatriation, one we need to consider that, and then the, neg the positive side of course there is job creation in my country, and then the goods exchange and trade of course it makes it easier when we have uh, different countries engaging in business. Though the advantages are there, but I think disadvantages are more. So I feel like uh, the advantage, first of all, it's uh, the development, the roads, uh, uh, you know, projects are coming up. We really appreciate their presence. On the positive side, we are looking at the employment to the people, the population of Uganda, as you, all Africans as they will set up uh, industries which will occupy poor uh, unemployed. They employ our people, they bring some things maybe which we don't have. If they don't have bad agenda, I think it is okay. But again, I feel like the disadvantages, like loans, um, now I'm thinking about the results of those loans, uh, they're going to take up even the small, 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 small businesses we have because we are unable to pay back. The other thing I, I feel like we are going to be taken over one of these days and you feel like we are in China, you know? We are no longer in Africa. Maybe adopting like their culture. The negative side that we are going to lose our resources. So this one creates us to be like we are slaves, that without them we are going to be people who cannot stand on our own. So this challenge creates us to be, uh, we shall go on to get more debts. These debts are going to accumulate, and we are the people who are supposed to pay for these debts. And the children who are going to, whom we are going to produce are going also to pay these debts, of which some of the people, the lowest people down there in the village, are suffering because of these debts we are getting. Because these countries are coming not because they are coming to trade only, but they have also other agendas to colonize you indirectly and take over your things. Well, Ugandans, they're telling us what they see as the pros and cons of their country's ties with China. Welcome back, Salim Solomon and Piro Kushle Nyandu. And uh, Salim, I want to start with you here. Um, you know, th there, there seems to be this perception that China, unlike the West, in its dealings with Africa, doesn't really demand things like transparency, democracy, um, doesn't really care about whether there's good governance, um, as long as it doesn't affect their, their projects. Um, there's also this perception that a country doesn't necessarily have to have have a very spotless human rights record. Uh, what is the reality? I mean, China's sort of non-interference posture, has that remained constant and consistent over the years, or was this really a false perception to begin with? Well, the way I see it as a journalist, obviously, because I'm skeptical, maybe, <laughs> I would say watch what they do, not what they say. Because uh, what they say sometimes, mm. I think, just like the ideologies, uh, might sound very flowery and, you know, no strings attached, especially if an African government or a, an autocrat or a, a dictator or a dictatorship uh, that wants to stay in power for 30 plus years or 20 plus years is presented with that kind of opportunity. Of course, he's going to say yes. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the thing is, uh, what they say and what they do are not really always the same. So. Uh, I would say, you know, look at what they do. Uh, I'll give you an example. And you've heard from a lot of Ugandans in that clip that some of them were very skeptical because one of their main opposition political presidential, uh, you know, candidate just most recently, Bobby Wine, who has come here in our studio and we've interviewed him, was hacked by, uh, uh, you know, a 5G uh, network called Huawei uh, by the help of the Chinese workers, helped the government. Uh, to look into his communications, not just his, but also into all of his network uh, to basically undermine and arrest and harass, sometimes, uh, you know, torture some of these uh, uh, opponents that are opposed to the leading party because the leading party is making deals with, uh, you know, the Chinese government. And so it's not really as direct and in your face, kind of, impact but you know surveillance is another area that china is investing a lot on uh, and another example you can think of is 
you know, assistance uh, they're providing to governments in it's what they call smart cities. Uh, and so uh, this is put in place in Benin, Morocco, Rwanda, and all these places. It's basically surveillance. I mean, it's, it's the, the, the risk of being uh, surveilled and also, you know, there's privacy concern involved. There's uh, data uh, theft involved. Uh, one of the flagship, actually, infrastructural uh, project in the capital city of uh, Ethiopia and Addis Ababa is the Africa, the headquarters of Africa Correct. Union. Right. Uh, for five years, uh, there were allegations that the Chinese government was spying on government uh, officials for five years. This is the biggest breach of government data. Uh, uh, you know, these are explosive allegations coming from reporters who studied it. Imagine uh, that data has been taken. So what are they doing with this information? Are they tracking government's movements? Are they trying to see how they even shape their policies toward African governments? And so despite all this controversy and skepticism, uh, the African Union went ahead and opened uh, an office in, 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 in Beijing. And so, you know, it's very complicated, uh, but uh, I would say just fundamentally, uh, instead of just looking at what's written and what they say, I would say watch what they're doing. Uh, right. more Actions so. speak louder than words. I'm brimming with cliches today. But Pio Kushle, you write about this as well, especially in the case of, of South Africa. Now, you talk about a, a sort of hands-off approach. Um, here, China kind of coming in, no strings attached. But um, as we saw in the case of the Dalai Lama um, from Tibet wanting to visit South Africa and being denied a visa, uh, but please tell us a little bit about the story behind that, because I think it's, it's very fascinating in terms of the China sort of non-interference uh, posture, but also this understanding on the part of governments about what flies and what doesn't. Well, yeah, well, China covers its back quite well, because by having a, this policy that comes from the five peaceful uh, pr principles of coexistence, there's a long history, but this idea of non-interference in, in countries' affairs, non-aggression, non and so on and so forth, it's able then to say, well, since I'm not interfering in your affairs as a country, then you cannot interfere in mine. So, because China, China's foreign policy, fundamentally, it's a defensive foreign policy. So whatever China does outside its borders, it's primarily for defensive purposes and secondarily then for economic purposes and so on and so forth, as they serve a defensive um, uh, end. There are four relationships a, a China has with a, a, between China and Africa. One is the relation between the Chinese government and an African government, the South African government here. Uh, two is the relationship between the Chinese government and South African citizens. Three, the relationship between the South African citizens and the Chinese government. And lastly, the relationship between Chinese people and South African people. So when you understand them, which of these four domains of relations we are dealing with, you are able to analyze this issue of the Dalai Lama as having as falling between the lines. You know, here is China uh, facing down South Africa. South Africa has hitherto, uh, this is 1996, 97, been keeping relations with Taiwan. And as those of you among your viewers who understand that you cannot have relations with the PRC if you still recognize Taiwan. So South Africa was caught in a bind from 94 all the way to 98. It had recognized Taiwan because of huge and immense and significant Taiwanese business interests. So the South African government of Mandela had to make a very tough decision, a, some may say an unprincipled decision, but a realistic decision of the times to say the state of South Africa is kind of going to divorce itself from the relation of da between Dalai Lama as a, a citizen and the, our relations uh, with the, the Chinese government. So it can get pretty complicated pretty quickly, and you often, un unfortunately, it's the people that usually uh, are the victims. Oh, uh, uh, people, uh, speaking of people who, who are the, the victims, and, and as we heard people say earlier in, in Uganda, um, you know, people have a particular view about China. A lot of it, people just don't know very much because it's not always, <laughs> in, you know, it's not, these are not house, this is not sort of household um, language that we use every day, and people don't sit around the table talking about, you know, so how are things going with China and our country. But, you know, people do run a risk of, um, you know, carrying the burdens of, of this relationship. I, I want to ask you straight, people, Kushle, are African countries in a debt trap? 
I mean, this is a debate that's going on between the West and what the Africans say, and then, of course, what China says. Uh, Africa has relationships, um, economic relationships, with other countries, too, um, with Turkey, for instance, with India. Um, they also have ambitions on the continent. But is Africa in a particularly serious debt trap um, where yeah. China is concerned? Yeah. Well, uh, as African, uh, straight answer, uh, yes, as they are with more, with almost all powers that are, uh, can actually lend them money. African countries have been bad at planning and using the capital that they've gotten. South Africa, for example, has just applied um, for a loan from the IMF, right, or billions of, of, of rands. Accountability has not taken place, uh, uh, place um, uh, when it comes to the PPE scandal, where the South African government basically money, significant sums of money donated by the business class disappeared from South Africans from South Africa's coffers and were unaccounted for. So the Africans have always been in trouble when it comes to lenders and using this money. This is why we must understand the China China coming into Africa now. Why it kind of seems to China seems to be more of a threat because there's just more money that's involved. Unlike the old, what I would call old scramble for Africa, kind of 1885 to 1970s, where it was kind of a rules-based system, you know, there was, it was formalized. Uh, but of course, it, it still had the same results too, which are the displacement of the Africans economically and, and their marginalization politically. So to the extent then that the Africans are, are not able to gain enough developmental wherewithal from these loans, they are in a debt in a debt trap, and it is a new scramble for Africa because it has the same results as the old scramble. Well, and of course, um, Western bondholders um, are very wary because they fear <laughs> that any money they lend will be used to, of course, service loans owed <laughs> to China. Uh, this does put Africa in quite a predicament. I'm going to, um, we've got about three minutes left here. Um, briefly, uh, Salem, how should African countries going forward now navigate this relationship? And are there strategies or opportunities for Africa to really capitalize on the rivalries between um, Western nations, Western powers, powers to the West, to the North, um, and to the East, of course, China? Uh, where are the opportunities for Africa to capitalize on that? I think I think Africans really need to, to look at uh, themselves in the mirror and, and see what you know other superpowers bring to the table uh, and make the choice not because they have to side with with say for instance you know the one China policy if you don't abide by that we don't have any deals with you or if you're covering issues about you know uh, Xinjiang uh, the the uh, you know Muslim internment camp and uh, in human rights abuses that China is trying to uh, uh, you know, hide from the world. If you're, say, for instance, reporting about that or talking about that, you have to make a stance uh, to avoid it so that you can have a relationship with China. And it, it doesn't have to be that way for, you know, African governments to make uh, choices and what kind of partner they, they want to build. You know, let the playing field be <laughs> open so that, uh, you know, as I said, you know, a lot of U.S. government officials would say, let, let you know, partnership be based on mutual benefit. Uh, everybody would look out for their own agenda, uh, not agenda, their own benefit. Uh, and, and, and I think that that would be beneficial uh, moving forward. Um, we're going to have to leave it there. Salem Solomon here with me in studio. Thank you so very much for your perspectives. And of course, Piwa Kushle and Nyandu, um, thank you for your perspectives and your time. You know you're a friend of the show. We'll have you back very soon. From all of us here in Washington, thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Goodbye.